I am Pierce. This is Ace Meg. That's Goldie in the far corner over there. And uh, our special guest is Sanity Bit. Hey, you could also say my name is a smig, sort of a like smig? you're sneezing, you know. Okay. Uh, a smig. It, okay. That works pretty well. Just saying. So, who here uses internet? <laughs> Yay! Uh, a basic overview of the technology. Um, WiMAX is fast wireless internet. Um, it's the 802.16 protocol, which is sort of similar to the 802.11 protocol. And it's especially interesting because it is under IEEE control. It's very different from a lot of the other mobile wireless specs that are under control of different um, mobile companies and things like uh, L LTE is the 4G technology that was come up with by the cell phone industry. And it's another high speed wireless internet system and currently with WiMAX there is a large nationwide network being developed and deployed by Clearwire and it is branded under the name Clear and a lot of people have probably seen it or commercials. Get closer to the mic. Closer to the mic. Yeah, light the mic. Okay. How do you hear the lips? God damn it. Yeah. So <laughs> So in the U.S. there are a couple of WiMAX networks. Um, the largest one, however, is Clear. Um, founded originally as Clearwire, they provided proprietary uh, wireless internet from Motorola called Expedience, and then later on um, bought up a lot of 2.5 gigahertz spectrum and started providing uh, 802.16 uh, WiMAX over that network. Um, they're currently deployed in 79 markets across 21 states. Um, and they have a very aggressive rollout plan. They're hoping to hit all major U.S. markets by the end of 2012. Uh, in the next three months alone, they're planning on hitting another 22 markets, including uh, New York, Miami, San Francisco. They also just opened up in uh, Washington, D.C., and uh, they're really aggressively rolled out in Texas right now. Um, there are actually a couple of their services using Clear's network, and these are all investors in Clear's in initial infrastructure. Um, it's Time Warner Cable, uh, selling it, rebranded as Roadrunner Mobile. Comcast, selling it as com uh, high Comcast High Speed to Go. And Sprint, which is one of the larger investors in Clear, which is using it for their 4G service uh, with their uh, HTC Evo. Um, they're all placed onto the same physical network. There's no difference on the infrastructure, as you can see in the screenshot. All of the signals are the same. It's the same tower. The only difference is what portal pages that are uh, company specific you get redirected to when you get on. <laughs> so this is this is a this is a map. Uh, the gray stuff is uh, a couple of the markets that they're opening. It's not showing all of them because of the zoom coverage, um, and. Uh, they're, they're in a lot of major markets, including Las Vegas. Okay. So last year we discussed uh, a couple of ways to bypass their portal page, and uh, apparently they were listening because they kind of tried to put a little plug in it. So last year, uh, we told you that you use op OpenVPN over UDP port 53, and it just blasts right through the portal page. So uh, their fix to that problem was, was they blocked large UDP packets from exiting the network on port 53. Uh, the counterfix to that was we just fragmented the packets to make them a little bit smaller. <laughs> it works great. Um, you just had to add two options to your OpenVPN config file, and that's pretty much all she wrote. So, next slide. So, that's uh, an example OpenVPN config file right there. And uh, anyone who's configured or played with OpenVPN, you already know how easy it is to get that set up, and you just got to add those two options, and you can go right through the portal page from the service providers. So. Going into some of the hardware now, this is a picture of some Echo Peak hardware, which is WiMAX gear from Intel. 
the interesting stuff about this is that it works in Linux, unlike a lot of the more consumer grade WiMAX gear. A lot of the WiMAX stuff that you buy at the store is for consumers and these come in a lot of I guess some of the newer ThinkPads and there are some companies that are selling laptops that have these built in. They're tiny PCIe cards and you can actually buy them on eBay for about $80 now. Um, the 5150 and the 5350 are the best supported in Linux and you go to linuxwimax.org and you can download the, uh, the network tools and all that and the version 1.4 is what you're looking for with the current version of Ubuntu and it actually has the firmware and the kernel drivers already installed, it just doesn't have the tools to connect to the network. Um, if you want to use these in an actual computer, you pretty much need to buy the USB PCIe cradle and those are about $40 that you can get them online. The PCIe cards, if you plug them into laptops, they typically don't work. The wireless part will work because this is actually 802.11 and 802.16 on this card. The 802.11 will work fine in any computer but the 802.16 is not we, we figure that it's not powered high enough or there's some weird issue where it's like newer PCIe buses are required um, but it hasn't worked in any of the laptops that we've tested even though there have been some think pads and stuff that we've seen that it will work on. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Okay, cool. So uh, I wasn't sure if anybody was actually awake this early on Sunday. This is my first time to DEF CON. No, it isn't. Um, <laughs> but I got the impression that people would be partying late last night and have a hard time rolling out of bed this morning. So anyway, again, my name is Asmig. At you, Asmig, just like that. I'm talking about hardware hacking a little bit. I don't really know much about it. I'm just getting started, but I've had some fun with it so far. And so what we're looking at right now is the Motorola CPE 150 and 750 devices. It's also known as the home router. It's sort of like a, a cable modem but no wires. It's kind of cool. Um, it says down there, got root. And, and do you? Well, you could. They are running Linux. So inside, 64 megs of RAM, 32 megs of flash, has a Basim wireless chipset, kind of cool. It's uh, Texas Instruments TNET V1061 at 213 megahertz, pretty awesome stuff there, very speedy. It's a MIPS 32 core, um, so if you want to know what your instruction set is, there it is, MIPS 32, pretty easy. The debugging is via JTAG, um, EJTAG in specific, and uh, so it's all nice standard stuff, but I didn't know how to use any of that stuff, so I had to like learn from scratch. It's kind of fun though. Um, and yeah, it is actually running Linux. We weren't sure at first, we thought it was probably Linux, but you know, didn't see any source floating around, so weren't sure until we pulled some some uh, some firmware dumps. So um, when you're looking at a device like those, oh, there they are. Um, what do you do to figure out what it's actually running? I mean, does anybody have any thoughts? Take it apart. Take it apart exactly. And then what? Burn it. Burn it. <laughs> yeah. Because it's crap. It, it, well, okay, sure. Yeah, looking at those specs, I might say that too. You know, pull off the RAM and chuck the rest. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Serial console. Serial console, good. Where do you find it though? Oscope. Yeah, I wish I knew how to use one of those. That'd be cool. <laughs> so um, here's my trick. This is a, a logic probe. And uh, it's kind of like my little magic wand. I'd be waving it around right now, except that I left it in my hotel room. Eh, sorry. It's pretty cool. I mean, all you have to do is you find the negative, you find the positive, and you clip those little leads, the, the color coded ones, you know, the red one for positive, the black one for, for negative. Really complicated stuff. Like, took me ages to figure that one out. And then there's the pointy bit, and you just like stab at the device randomly until <laughs> something happens. It's like. Uh. I thought it was pretty cool. I, I don't know. So eventually what I found is that if you put it on this one pad and then you plug in the device, then all of a sudden the red and green light on this thing would just light up like a Christmas tree. I was like, oh, awesome. Hey, that's doing something. And it was right next to, you know, a couple other pads. Seems like maybe that was serial. So sure enough, I found the serial port. 
and you know, I was poking around a little bit more. I also labeled the processor, flash, RAM, each one. Yeah, just in case. I actually had to solder the headers on myself, um, and uh, they are surface mount headers, so they're, they're kind of a hassle. Um, you've actually all seen them if you've seen the DEF CON badge this year, which I hope you have. If you're in this room and you haven't seen the DEF CON badge, get the hell out. <laughs> Anyhow, that, that uh, JTAG connector is actually the exact same connector as used on the, the DEF CON badge this year. And the serial connector is a little bit different, but pretty close. So how do you talk to the JTAG? Well, I stole this from the internet and uh, if alec at sensi.org is here, thank you for this fine schematic. It, it came in handy. I built this thing out of it and it actually worked. <laughs> Nobody else is surprised? I'm freaking surprised. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And it gave me stuff like this. Now I know you can't actually read that. You're not supposed to be able to read that. This is like the token slide. You know, everybody has a, a presentation with a slide that has so much crap in it you can't actually read it. Well, this is that one. Except that the people that are right next to the projectors might see something in the bottom two lines that looks interesting. Anybody just like shout that out? Yeah, yeah, console state locked. Well, what does that mean? Uh, I don't know. Well, okay. So it also has some other information in there that seems pretty handy. It talks about where the bootloader it is. It talks about where the different images are, the configurations, the certificates for the device. Yeah, X509 certificate. That's pretty cool. And uh, factory defaults. Also, this JFFS2. Has anybody heard of that? Yeah, cool. Well, for those of you who don't know, that's a partition where you can actually read and write data. Um, it's pretty, pretty fancy for Flash, anyway. So what about the root? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this device, it can be rooted. Um, I did it the worst possible way. Okay, so this way works, but it sucks. And, and I know that it sucks now because I've, I've actually gotten into the device and been able to play with it. But for a first approach, you know, it got the job done. And my approach was, well, let's just jump back a couple slides. So in the bootloader, um, we saw that that information that had the, the console state locked and all that stuff. And that's actually the default bootloader configuration that gets dropped into the bootloader config area. So if you take the bootloader config area and you delete it, then it reloads from the bootloader area. And you can easily modify the bootloader config default, have it regenerate a new bootloader config, and then let it boot up. Um, but the problem is once it boots up a little ways, then this fancy program runs. And what it does, uh, according to the strings here, is basically it says, oh, did the console state somehow magically get set to unlocked? We don't want that. And it resets it to locked. So that's kind of a hassle. So my workaround for that was to reset it to unlocked, boot part of the way, freeze it, reset it back to locked so that it doesn't change anything, and then let it finish booting. Yeah, a little trickery, you know. I have JTAG control, so I can control the, the operation, and I don't, I don't really know how that stuff works. So, I'm taking a poor man's approach, and hey, it got the job done. Then I found that there's some uh, interesting stuff with this file uh, that's being called from that that previous script, and, and it turns out that as long as this file exists, then that that previous program doesn't actually do this relocking thing, and that makes it really handy to continue having root on the device once you get it. So basically all you'd have to do is just drop in this file as soon as you've got access to the thing and then you can reboot it and you've got complete access for as long as you want. It enables SSH so you can SSH into it with a default user pass which is pretty cool. Uh, and this file even gets executed so if you have anything that you want to have run every time you boot up the device like um, you know, killing SNMPD or uh, changing your firewall rules or, you know, changing passwords so that you're not using default everything for everything, yeah, you know, it's a handy place to do that. So once you have root, you can go ahead and enable SSH um, and then you can SSH into the device with a default login of admin and password tools. It drops you into a debug command line, which you can drop out of with the 
and I type it in shell, which then drops us to a very old version of BusyBox. Um, by exporting the path of all of the uh, binary locations, we can see all the system binaries. There's a lot of stuff there. Um, there's stuff to control the radio. There's um, some debug commands that were built in by Basim. Um, but there's just way too much to cover here. Um, what is interesting is that you have direct access to IP tables um, and you can access the CVE tools which allow you to um, directly read and write to certain parts of memory on the device, um, adjust radio configuration parameters and possibly break your device if you don't know what you're doing. So be careful. Um, so the devices have a web interface with a default password of Motorola. You just type in the password. Um, if you look behind the scenes though, it's just passing the username router behind this uh, in the form. Uh, if you change that to admin tools, you log in and bypass any password protections on the web interface. Um, and there's no changing that unless you actually have a shell on the device. So any default consumer device that hasn't been unlocked um, is affected by this. Um, by default, it's not web, web accessible, but if anyone gets on your LAN and you've changed your password on your device, they can get right back in and change everything. Um, this year at B-Sides, I logged in and changed the host name to my username so when people trace right it out, they would see me and be like, who the fuck is that guy? These are some of the clear mobile devices. Uh, the one that you see in the middle is the basic mobile USB stick. It's been out for a while. You plug it into your laptop and you get a 4G connection. It works in uh, it works in Windows and OS 10 now. It's got some people working on trying to get Linux support, but it's still kind of sketchy. Um, the second device that you see is the 3G 4G USB stick and that will actually downgrade to 3G if you're in an area that doesn't have the 4G, which is nice. Um, the next spot that you see here is, or the next device up at the top is the clear spot. The clear spot is essentially a wireless access point, which is really neat because then you can plug in the mobile device and it will use the mobile device to get to the internet and distribute out the connection to a local wireless network so anyone can connect in. And by default, the la er, all the passwords for the clear spot to log on and to get into the admin interface is the last three bytes of the MAC address in hex form, so six characters. And you can just see that from the network traffic. So that's not necessarily the best default password to use if you're going to use a default password. But Haha, <laughs> you have to listen to me again. Uh, so the, the mobile devices, eh, not quite as exciting, less RAM, less flash, uh, a little bit faster processor. It's a weird one. It's a, a mass or massy. I'd never actually seen one of these before, you know, but not that I've seen much. Um, the chip debugging is a royal pain in the behind. Uh, it's not using standard JTAG. It's using SPI. Now a lot of you are probably familiar with SPI as a, a method for accessing flash or uh, a RAM or, or other devices. Um, but for actually doing debu debugging, it's kind of a strange thing. I, I've never seen it before. I had to read some articles to figure that one out. Um, it's using a completely proprietary instruction set which makes it a challenge to figure out exactly what's going on inside. And it's definitely not running Linux. Um, so at that point, I became a lot less interested in it. But in order to figure that out, of course, you have to figure out what's in the board again. And uh, since the JTAG interface was non-existent, and that was really frustrating for me, I didn't really know how to pull the memory out of the or the pull the dumps out of the flash. Um, so I got creative. And uh, oh, I just gave it away. Shoot, I was gonna show something else, which got oh, there it is, in the wrong order. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> so if you look at this this chip that's in the red box, and I know that you can't actually tell from where you're sitting, most likely, um, the solder job on that chip looks really horrible. It's because uh, I did it by hand. Um, 
And basically what I did is I just pulled the flash off of the, uh, the clear spot and I put it onto a different device. And I'm curious if anybody out there can recognize that device. I heard Linksys. Is it a WR54G? No, it is not. It's close though. Oh, hand over here. Motorola surfboard, that is correct. What model? <laughs> well, okay, <laughs> cheater. Yeah, okay, so here's a closer view. Um, yes, it's the surfboard 5120. And uh, yeah, that board has MIPS 32, EJ tag, all the stuff that I'm totally familiar with, which is basically the same as on the, uh, um, the, the home router. Uh, so I was able to just <laughs> drop the flash on there and my tool set was already ready for me. And I was able to pull the flash off like that. Um, so this is a, a mod that uh, was done by a friend of ours, uh, Loki, um, basically just putting a big antenna onto the USB stick and uh, it works great. Um, so there's a lot of different options as far as the, the mobile devices and uh, tearing them apart and playing with them. This is the HTC Evo. I'm very happy to have gotten mine uh, a couple weeks ago. It is the first mobile device that has the 4G built into it and so it uses WiMAX. It uses a Sequans chipset so it's a bit different than anything that we've really looked at before. But when I was uh, getting familiar with some of the Android tools, I did the whole ADB shell and poked around a bit and noticed that if you use get prop and set prop, you can list out a lot of the variables that are stored in the um, the like environment variables sort of deal that has a lot of the configuration details for the WiMAX, which is really interesting and it'll tell you things about the like towers that you're connected to and like MAC address and just a whole bunch of really interesting numbers. Uh, when I flash my modem using Toast's what step two of the how to root your Android, I noticed that he had uh, modified an engineering build of the Evo firmware, which is really neat because that came with a bunch of diagnostic tools for WiMAX. And I ripped those APKs out of that build and put them on the website. And so now if you download the APKs, you can install them onto whatever version of the phone that you have. So that's kind of fancy and it lets you see things like tower connectivity and little debug logs and all sorts of fun with that. Uh, also if you have a rooted phone, you can do the WiMAX tether, which essentially turns the phone into a clear spot, which is really nice. And it also has really good access controls. Uh, yesterday I got to play with a deactivated Evo and I noticed that even when it has no service, you get the captive portal page and the captive portal page can be bypassed with the same techniques that were discussed earlier except it's on a phone, which is nice. Uh, right now if you want to be using WiMAX on the phone, you pretty much have to be using 2.1, which is like Android 2.1, which is the version that comes with the phone. And I've messed with Fresh and I've messed with Damage Control and they both seem to work fine for the WiMAX uh, Cyanogen does not quite work yet, but ToCFH and the other guy uh, are working really, really hard on getting that working. And they're trying to get it working with the Android WiMAX framework that was released from Clear about a year ago, which is neat because then it would all be open source connectivity to the <coughs> drivers and that will allow Cyanogen to continue to have the 4G in their builds from then on. So by show of hands, how many people here uh, like their privacy when they're using their wireless devices of any kind? Very cool. Uh, you guys are going to be upset with this. Uh, they're running uh, location-based services. A lot of the major telcos, uh, wireless telcos, are getting this all ramped up and they're trying to say that, you know, this is the next thing for social networking and that uh, you should just let all your friends know where you're at, you know, with the phone that's in your pocket, you know, things like Google Latitude are taking advantage of that and whatnot. 
But uh, with location-based services with WiMAX, it's a little bit different. Uh, basically, there's two types of ways you can get uh, your location with uh, Clear or Sprint or any of them. Uh, the first one is a client-server relationship that is done through Ajax and a web page. So you go to the web page or the URL that's listed right there and it will bring up a pretty little Google Maps and put a dot with a circle around it of roughly the location that you're in. The second way is for uh, direct server to server communication and that's using uh, a Parallel X API and that allows me as a developer or the service provider to put in your IP address or MAC address and I can just find out where you're at. Uh, no questions asked and uh, so basically, uh, next. So after playing around with this a little bit, uh, as soon as I got access to this, first thing I wanted to do is find out how accurate is this. I mean, is this something where they're going to be able to drop a missile on your head by using LBS or not? So I set up a script, recorded my location, and just drove around town for hours and hours and hours. And it was actually pretty impressive driving around. Like you maintain connectivity at 60 miles an hour going down the freeway. So I was pretty impressed by that. But I started to notice that uh, through the Parallel X API, all the ranges I was getting seemed to be predefined. It wasn't dynamic. And all the ranges are listed right there that I saw driving around town and there was nothing in between those numbers. So you can see the level of accuracy that the location-based services has. Now, the way they're doing this is based on the tower and the sector panel uh, location and the orientation of that panel. They keep track of every panel. They know exactly which degree it is pointing. And then they take the power reading and basically are determining how far away or how accurate that is. However, they are working on uh, using multiple towers to help basically triangulate where you're at and to increase the accuracy of that. It is being worked on, but there has not been an announced ETA on that. And I'm kind of curious to see how accurate that's going to be and see if the predefined ranges kind of goes out the window and it gets a little bit more accurate. So this is the part that really kind of caught my attention was that with the location-based services, if you go sign up or you just buy hardware, you're opted in by default. And if you don't like that, tough shit. They don't let you opt out. You have to email engineering. You've got to get a hold of the right people in the engineering department and say, I want my LBS turned off. Otherwise, doesn't matter if you're using Sprint Comcast, Clear, Time Warner, it, someone gets your IP address, they can pop it in there and find out roughly where you're at. And another thing we noticed driving around is that there seems to be random dead spots throughout the network. And it's like you just, you're on one tower and you drive into this area and you're gone. Like LBS quits reporting, gives you back a service error and you just find a dead spot. So. Uh, that might be interesting if anyone's doing any fun things over WiMAX. Uh, you might want to maybe play around with that and go find a dead spot. That might be advisable. So, Right now, none of these uh, WiMAX devices have an open source firmware and that's definitely something that I think would be really cool to see in the future. Uh, we're also looking at trying to put something like OpenWort on one of these home devices to actually get real control and package management on what's going on on the system. Um, also, the future of WiMAX, the 802.16m spec provides a uh, one gigabit fixed bandwidth, which is pretty fast. And I, I don't know how they're going to pull that off. I mean, I've, <laughs> I've looked at the spec, but I've seen it in labs and I don't know how they're claiming they're going to get one gigabit a second over the airwaves. I just, I don't buy it. I'll believe it when I see it. Did you want 
Um, so I just uh, posted some stuff to our Google group, which um, will be listed on a slide later on. Maybe it's the next one. Oh, oh, what do you know? There it is right there. So there's the YMX Hacking Google group. Uh, that's second from the bottom down there. And uh, if you go to that list, you'll see the post that I just made that points to the uh, Google Code project. And uh, that has some, some code for you to play with. Um, the uh, APKs that uh, Pierce mentioned earlier uh, for your Evo. And uh, also some, some stuff that I put together for um, using op open OCD in order to, to do the JTAG with the, um, the home router device. And uh, does anybody want to see a demo of the device getting rooted? Yeah? Because yeah? I think we have a couple of minutes and we could probably set that up. I don't know. I mean, that, was, that seemed like a medium. I mean, we could also do it in somewhere else, you know. Yeah? Okay. Okay. I heard the bring it. That sounds good. That sounds good. Is there anything else on here we need to show? Does everybody have these URLs down? I'm going to pull the plug. They're on the disk. Right? They're, well, uh, they're, they're on the internet. They're on the interwebs. And the disk points you to the interwebs. So it'll get you there eventually. Just close my lid and you'll be fine. Pardon our brief changeover. So while he's doing that, uh, I would like to point out that it was pretty disturbing that even through your, when you go to the Clear website, you're a paying customer, you log into your account, check your account or whatever, there is no option to opt out of this LBS system. It just, it doesn't exist. And that really kind of sucks because we would like to see a opt out option, especially as a paying customer when we're paying for, you know, half a dozen devices. Uh, we just don't want to be tracked. That's it. They don't. No one has a right to know my location, and we just think that they should give us an option to opt out of this. Because uh, right now you're stuck. That's it. You buy this gear, you can be tracked. So that's something to think about. Those of you who go out and get WiMAX, and if it comes to your areas, uh, consider emailing customer service if you can. Uh, go to developer.clear.com. Dig around. You can find uh, some engineers that are on there and, uh, you know, say your piece and hopefully we can get this implemented. And that's being tracked by anyone with a developer key. Which, by the way, they gave me for free. Yeah. I just asked for it. <laughs> they sent it back. Can you change your MAC address? Right now we cannot change our MAC address. Well, you're not supposed to anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so is this supposed to just uh, pop up there or does somebody have to push a button somewhere? No. Okay. That means I'm doing it wrong. No, no. Screen stems that way. Oh. Screen stems that way. There we go. Yeah, thanks. Hey, Kenny. Check screen. Check screen. No, I don't think that's a console. <laughs> hey. hey. It was totally there. Where'd it go? I didn't change anything. Control Z. I heard that. It's still before noon. <laughs> LBS will work if you're on the tower, if you're connected to the network. It will uh, be able to tell roughly where you're at. Um, it, well, 
Hey, it's there. <laughs> All right, Kenny, 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 look at this screen. You had a console blinking. I think that one's being chopped at the top, dude. Hit enter a couple times. I'm pressing enter. Now it's gone again. All right, I'll keep stalling. So, yeah, right now it's a single tower and single panel antenna and that's really the only way they're determining where you're at. Uh, again, like I said, it's several hundred meters is generally the distance between uh, each predefined range right now that they can determine. So it's not horribly accurate, but if I really was determined to go get you, I could use LBS to narrow down roughly where you're at and kind of go snoop around from there. Um, hey. I see a hand. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Here's the caveat with that. Location-based services will tell if you're lying. So. So we've noticed with we've noticed with Clear because we had some friends that we all met when we all came to DEF CON. Uh, we told them buy some gear, and they got here, and it just started working for days. I mean, they didn't register, didn't do anything. So it's kind of like they're they're giving you a teaser when you buy the gear. It just works for a little bit, so you can get a taste of it, and then they're just like, oh, okay, pay us. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, they, and they do do that. We've also noticed that with some of these home routers, uh, they seem to kind of keep tabs on your home router once it's been turned on. They're like, hey, we notice you in this area. And then if your home router like starts jumping all over the place, they, it, it quits working in some areas. So. Do the demo in the breakout session. Here's, it doesn't stop LBS, so. We haven't any luck yet. I see blinky cursor maybe. Hey, we got a blinky cursor. That's good. Hey. There we go. <laughs> so, what this is doing right now is, um, is basically. This is this is really gross. I'm kind of embarrassed by it. Actually, I'm really embarrassed by it. It took me a long time to be okay and settle in with the concept of releasing this code to the public because it's so awful. But it's effective. Um, so I've got a shell script that's starting screen that's using OpenOCD to uh, load some TCL scripts because OpenOCD uses TCL as its script interpreter. Man, I haven't touched TCL in like 10 years. You guys remember egg drop bots? Anyway, different story. Um, so these TCL code bits, they're bringing in some MIPS32 machine code and dropping it via JTAG and that's what's actually transferring data between, you know, flash and RAM and, and moving things around. So I'm, I'm taking, oh, hey, I think it's mostly done actually. Um, there's a nice little PS listing and uh, that's what's running on the box and, and there's root. Uh, it takes about a minute and a half to run. Yeah. Um, so what it did, does anybody care? Yes. Sort of? A little bit? I mean, because there's the mailing list too and there's going to be documentation there. So I don't want to bore everybody to death here. Yep. What, what the hell did it do? I don't know. I, I try to figure it out sometimes, but man, most of this code I wrote it like a year ago, so I've kind of forgotten. Um, but generally, so what it's doing is it, it goes in and, and uh, it transfers the bootloader config to a temporary area, um, you know, just somewhere else in Flash where it won't get nuked, and uh, then allows the original bootloader config to be overwritten or to it actually erases it and lets a temporary one be be written. Um, I just said um. I'm trying not to do that. Huh. Mental note. Thanks. Drink. <laughs> Have any of you spoken before at one of these conferences? Yeah. Show of hands. 
just like, yeah, there's a couple people. Okay, <laughs> you feel my pain. This is my first time, so you know. And it's still 10 a.m. and goddamn, last night was it's awesome. 10 so. <laughs> it's almost 11. <laughs> Shoot, what time is it anyway? Oh, almost there. 11. Cool. Close. Well, I should get the heck out of here then. Uh, so. The gist of the story is it shuffles a bunch of junk around, lets things get recreated, and then kind of uh, does a little jerry rigging and a little bit of this and a little bit of that to, to sneak this console state unlocked past the scripts that are checking for it and the, the program that um, automatically resets it to locked. Uh, I can uh, page up through this stuff, but it's really boring. If you, if you want more detail, really, I think you should just come and chat with me because. Seriously, the, the details and the nitty gritty and looking at the, the MIPS 32 code is, is pretty gross. Um, but the code is available for perusal at this point and there are some comments in there that probably don't make any sense because I've been making them for the last, you know, eight hours or so instead of sleeping. <laughs> so it's good times, good times, yeah. And we have the, uh, the breakout session in 107, I think. 107. So. Be there, if, be square. If you or, want any more, you know, intimate question asking sessions or anything, then yeah. uh, we'll be over there. Are there any uh, questions while we're in here? Yeah. Any big ones? I got a question over here. No. Okay, so the, the question was uh, that last year during the talk we announced that uh, any two modems on the network, whether they were registered or not, could talk to each other. And so the question was, did they ever patch that? Did they do anything to it? No, they didn't. Uh, if you have the hardware, it gives you an IP address. It's pretty much like a big, giant, nationwide wireless LAN party. I mean, if you got your friend's IP address, go nuts. Just tunnel, play video games, stream movies, do whatever the hell you want. I mean, oh, I didn't say that. Yeah, make sure you pay for service so you don't get in trouble, you know? Yeah. LBS is a bitch. They will be able to come find you. It's going to be a lot different than like big, giant, shared, wired you know, cable networks like Comcast, they'll be able to track you a lot more finite than Comcast could do on their network with people who are, you know, stealing service. It's always very important to balance the give and take ratio. <laughs> how much do you pay them versus how much do you take from them? You know, <laughs> it's very important to keep that all in mind. Um, also, one thing that we did mention last year apparently was that the, uh, the clear spot runs Linux, um, and that's not true. It does not run Linux. We learned the hard way. Sorry about that. But just so you know, it's not Linux. Any other questions? Can LBS be used for mass surveillance? Can LBS be used for mass surveillance? Ooh. So, uh, I think what you'd be referring to is like just drift netting anything, everything that comes in there. Um, I believe it could. They have two different servers. They got a development server and a production server, but both kind of give you the same results. And uh, with the development environment though, they're a little bit more restrictive than the production environment. The production environment's sitting on some big old servers that just kind of let you go nuts. And uh, again, like I said, it's opt-in. You really do not have control of that. You are you get on the network, within a few minutes someone could look you up on LBS and there's not a whole lot you could do. And you could just start going through every possible MAC address or IP address in the net block and just start pulling people's locations and you could, after several hours, probably data mine a good portion of everyone's location going through one of these networks. So, so I think the short version of that is LBS scary? And the answer LBS very yes. scary, yes. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> Does Clear tell people that they're being <laughs> tracked via LBS? Is it in the contract? Has anybody seen it? I think that's the answer, really. If nobody's noticed that it's in the contract, then it's not visible enough. Whether they are actually including it or not, it's not visible enough. And that's effectively a no. Yes? I'm not sure how that differs very much from the cell phone tracking that they do for E911 services. Or the it's that anyone can do it. Like I, I said before, I mean, it, it <laughs> does require authorized access, but I asked for access and they gave it to me for free. 
Yeah. So the, the question comment was, uh, oh. what's the difference here between E911 tracking and this LBS stuff? Uh, well, LBS is available to any developer who wants to sign up for it. E911, you kind of have to be like in 911. <laughs> that, I think that's the significant difference is we're giving our location information in real time to anyone else who wants it. And I'm not cool with that. Anybody else? Cool. Well, thanks a lot for your time. Again, this is Goldie, Sanity Bit, Pierce, and I am a Smig. Have a great day. Thank you, thank you guys. Breakout in 107.